thing back where it came from was so help me. So help me, so help me, and come. Monsters, Inc. is an absolutely genius film. Pixar was just operating on another planet in their early run. It felt like every film tapped into kids' brainwaves on a molecular level. Are brainwaves molecules? Whatever. Monsters, Inc. not only captured a concept that every kid understands, but expanded on it and subverted it in such a fun way. They take the very simple concept of, there's a monster in my closet, and effortlessly build a fully realized, ridiculously imaginative world within that closet. An entire separate universe that explains why monsters are in the closet in the first place. An entire industry built from kids' screams. Like Nike or Apple, but with more whimsy and less, oh, let's not talk about that right now. But on top of that, they also subvert those monsters' relationships to the kids making the monsters terrified of children, believing they're dangerous and only scream harvesting out of necessity. There is so much going on in that premise, and yet the film sells the entire thing within the first few minutes. Just incredible storytelling. But within that world, you've got these great characters with their own place within that world structure, and just one little kid sneaking into the monster world completely upends their entire worldview. Sully and Mike are such a great duo, built on incredible performances from Billy Crystal and John Goodman. But for me, the heart of the story is Boo. Even though this was earlier Pixar and there are still remnants of the creepy human-faced issues that plagued Toy Story, she's still one of the cutest characters in movie history. Most of my biggest laughs in this entire film are from hilarious little kidisms that feel so genuine coming out of this character. Well, hello there. What's your name? Mike Wazowski! But more specifically, it's that relationship between Boo and Sully. Sully is a character who is literally on top of the monster world as it exists. He's the greatest scarer in Monstropolis history. He's about to break the all-time record. He could not have it more made. But he's so focused on that job, on that record, on being the best scarer, that he doesn't really have much of a life of his own. He doesn't even take advantage of his own clout. You see that juxtaposition with Mike, who loves his car and has a girlfriend, uses Sully's pull to get reservations, plans to propose, but when trying to save his own neck, Sully unwittingly forms this relationship with Boo, and it's the core of the film. You see him slowly warm up to her, slowly realize kids aren't a danger to monsters, and eventually form this fierce paternal instinct to protect her at all costs. He realizes that these connections mean so much more than a scare record, to the point where he's willing to upend the entirety of their society, everything people believe, to protect this girl. It's so sweet. Every cute moment between the pair just yanks on my heartstrings, and few moments in Pixar history get me more emotional than the pair's goodbye in Boo's room. The way she excitedly shows him all her toys, the sad look and hug when he says goodbye, and of course, the devastating peek back into the closet from Boo to find that Sully is gone. All time, man. I love this film. I've always been a fan, but over the years, this has continued to move up my favorite Pixar list. These days, it is definitely near the top. In addition to the excellent world building and heartwarming character relationships, the animation seriously holds up. Looking at this thing compared to its competition this year, Jimmy Neutron and Shrek, actually kind of embarrassing how much better it looks. A great nomination and one of Pixar's best. Finding Nemo is an enduring classic for a reason. Not only just an exceedingly fun and heartfelt film, as was to be expected from Pixar, but a story that actually has something to say, which I guess was also to be expected from Pixar. I feel like everyone talks about how traumatizing the opening sequence of Up is, but Finding Nemo did something super similar six years earlier. Maybe it was a bit less relatable because it's about fish and not senior citizens. But Finding Nemo is actually about trauma, and man, the opening sequence is scary. It's easy to understand why Marlin is so devastated scared of losing Nemo after losing literally everybody else, which I think is super key to this story. You truly understand his fear and trauma, but you also feel for little Nemo, who doesn't deserve to be sheltered so unnecessarily. But Marlin learning when to take risks and when to let go is such a satisfying journey. While the ocean is still filled with danger, as Marlin expected, so many of the things that terrified him weren't what he expected. And the only way he made any progress in his quest to find the titular Nemo was by taking those risks. If he hadn't gone with the sharks, he wouldn't have found the goggles with the address on them. If they hadn't risked traversing the jellyfish, they never would have found the East Australian current. If they hadn't found the current, they never would have met the sea turtles. If he hadn't opened up to the sea turtles and told them about his journey across the ocean, the story wouldn't have been spread all the way to Sydney. If that story hadn't spread to Sydney, Nemo would never have been inspired by his father's courage to try and escape the tank. I particularly loved how Marlin meeting the sea turtles uses actual turtle biology and behavior to help illustrate to Marlin that sometimes you need to trust that your kids are going to make it, through the fact that baby sea turtles have to 
hatch and crawl to the ocean all on their own. It's the first thing they ever do. Little dudes are just eggs. We leave them on a beach to hatch, and then coo 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 choo, they find their way back to the big old blue. But Marlin learning how to take those leaps of faith, and why giving his son the freedom to take risks is important, really hits emotionally. You can't never let anything happen to him. Then nothing would ever happen to him. But man, I think nothing tugs at my heartstrings more than when Nemo is hearing about his father's travels, hearing all of the risks and dangers he's faced just to save him, something he never expected from his father. The way this moment plays out is beautiful. Rather than focusing on the pelican telling the story, the shot stays focused on Nemo. In fact, the score swells up so much that it sort of drowns out the story, because the story itself is not the important thing. The important thing is the way it is inspiring Nemo, and that we as the audience see that admiration on his face. It's a masterful piece of storytelling. And even after they reunite, they are so smart to put everything each character has learned to the test immediately. In order to save Dory, Marlin has to trust that Nemo is capable, that he knows the risk is worth it, even though failure means being caught by a fisherman again. Pixar is just so good at tying a perfect little bow on these journeys. Finding Nemo is not my favorite Pixar, but it's damn good storytelling with an outstanding cast, down to the side characters, and my god does that animation hold up even 20 years later. I mean, the jellyfish scene in particular is mind-blowing. It's genuinely so hard to believe that this was done in 2003. Finding Nemo is a great film that certainly deserved this nomination. You know I'm retired from hero work. As am I, Robert. Yet here we are. <laughs> Oh man, we have reached The Incredibles, the first nomination for one of our greatest living animation directors, Brad Bird. The Incredibles was actually a pretty significant departure for Pixar, in part because it's a bit more mature than their previous films, but mostly because this was the first time they brought in an outside director to lead a project. From Toy Story through Finding Nemo, every Pixar project had been originally developed in-house and produced and directed by that core leadership group of John Lasseter, Pete Docter, and Andrew Stanton, among others. But Bird's concept for The Incredibles goes back as far as the early 90s, being the first and still one of the only film concepts that Pixar adopted. A pretty wild gamble for a studio whose usual approach had knocked it out of the park for five films in a row. Of course, The Incredibles gamble paid out. The film was rightfully a massive success, adored by critics and audiences alike. And man, is it easy to see why. This film is so funny, has some absolutely top-tier action sequences, maintains its emotional hook with a focus on family, and pays homage to spy films in 1960s comic books with its excellent world building. It is just, across the board, a spectacular film. They, of course, establish the world immediately and brilliantly through old documentary footage, showing our heroes talk about life as heroes and showcasing the height of the golden superhero era, all while brilliantly setting the stage for what's to come, intertwining their heroism, the introduction of Buddy, aka Incrediboy, aka Syndrome, the wedding of Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl, and of course the event that led to the outlawing of superheroism, which happens to be a foiled suicide attempt, which leads to a lawsuit against Mr. Incredible. Incredible. This movie is clearly much darker and more mature than Pixar's previous entries, but these first 10 minutes just perfectly build this world and establish what these characters have lost. Why, in the 15 years after superheroes were outlawed, Bob is so miserable. Pixar is just so good at putting a human story at the center of extraordinary events. Yeah, this is a story about superheroes returning to save the world from a massive threat, but it's also about a man looking back at his glory days, and a family struggling to find their place in a world that has seemingly moved past them. That focus on the family is absolutely the secret sauce here, both thematically and for the perfect comedy of their family dynamics. Are we there yet? We get there when we get there! Brad Bird also gave each member a perfectly fitting superpower, as described by Bird himself. The dad is always expected in the family to be strong, so I made him strong. The moms are always pulled in a million different directions, so I made her stretch, like Taffy. Teenagers, particularly teenage girls, are insecure and defensive, so I made her turn invisible and turn on shields. And ten-year-old boys are hyperactive energy balls. Babies are unrealized potential. But their abilities aren't just thematically fitting, their family dynamics also have an entire arc and journey of their own. The family really struggles to connect earlier in the film. They're a complete mess, really. Dash is getting in trouble at school, he and Violet are fighting at dinner, Bob and Helen can barely contain them, and it's especially tough on the kids, who have these abilities but have never really had an opportunity to explore them, given that they were born into a world where those abilities were outlawed. They struggle to find their place in this world because they're forced to hide who they actually are, but once they're given the opportunity to actually use, explore, and hone their abilities, they all finally start to sync with each other. The sequence where Dash and Violet combine their speed and force field abilities is just the perfect blend of thematic resonance and super rad shit. But Bob's journey is probably the one that hits the hardest. Blind. 
to what I have. So obsessed with being undervalued that I undervalued all of you. Dad? Shh, don't interrupt. Bob is so caught up in reliving the glory days, feeling needed by the world after being discarded, he doesn't appreciate or embrace the era of his life that he was actually living in. You obviously see how much he loves his family, but he takes them for granted until he nearly loses them. I can't. Not again. I'm not strong enough. The final sequence of this thing is just gas. Rather than be overly protective, sidelining his family and fighting on his own, he fully embraces this new era of his life by saving the day with his family. And they really nail this entire sequence. They truly would not have saved the day without one another. Each character's abilities are vital to saving each other and defeating the drone at some point in this battle. I've loved The Incredibles since I was a kid, but it's a Pixar that has really stood the test of time. While I geeked out on the action and humor when I was younger, now I really appreciate the way it balances its themes with that action and humor. It's a real masterpiece. They say it was amazing. He won three piston cups. <laughs> he did what in his cup? Ah, Cars. Basically the first time the general public watched a Pixar film and said, meh. And the only feature nomination for disgraced animator John Lasseter. This is such a fascinating franchise because it's actually one of Disney's highest earners, thanks to the merchandise. Meanwhile, the films are generally looked down upon. And not without good reason. Cars 2 in particular is not great. I'm wearing Mater Hoosh. However, I still maintain that the first Cars is pretty solid. Mostly disliked because of Pixar's impeccable record prior to its release. Plus the, uh, sort of confusing world building if you think too hard about it. But honestly, I think if Cars was maybe 30 minutes shorter, it would have been much more fondly looked back on. Once again, Pixar's animation holds up even all these years later. This film looks amazing, especially the driving montages that showcase the beautiful countrysides. On top of that, it's just a generally stylish film. The races themselves are really fun and suspenseful. But I also think the film does a pretty great job conveying its themes and character arcs, and I honestly think they hit even harder 18 years later. Lightning is a character who is so focused on himself, so focused on success and fame that he doesn't care about those around him, or the people he throws under the, uh... <laughs> bus on the way to success. And that feels even more prescient in today's social media driven society than it did in 2006. I mean, can you imagine if Lightning had a TikTok? We would have gotten like 10 times as many ka-chow, ka -chows. He's a character whose entire purpose is to drive full steam ahead as fast as possible. Speed running success, when all he actually needed was to slow down and appreciate the beauty of the world around him. Honestly, a message I really need at this point in my life as I sit here watching 99 movies in a row for work. Lightning taking the time to appreciate the people in Radiator Springs, the same kinds of people he would have written off in the beginning of the film is undeniably satisfying, especially in the sequence when he helps everyone in town and they light up the neon signs again. Just a really gorgeous, beautiful series of events. And the final race does such a fun job portraying that change in Lightning. His struggle to focus until his new friends show up to support him in the pit, the things he learned in Radiator Springs like driving backwards from Mater and the turn right to go left from Doc, all coming into play during the race, and of course the ultimate showcase of his change, forfeiting the Piston Cup so he can push the crashed King across the finish line. Look, the world is absolutely bizarre and raises far more questions than it answers, like do not think too hard about where cars come from, or the class system, or why they need sleep and gas, or why cows are tractors and where those come from, or why the big asphalt machine Bessie is just a tool and not a sentient being like everyone else, or how any of this works really. Many of the side characters are caricatures and uninteresting, and the film is absolutely 30 minutes too long, but I think the way everything comes together is very satisfying. It's not incredible, but it's very solid. I think it doesn't get the credit it deserves. Cars 2 though, that is a non-starter. Ratatouille doesn't sound delicious. It sounds like rat and patootie. You might be surprised to hear that when I first saw Ratatouille years ago, I thought it was just okay. I was kind of surprised it was receiving such a huge level of hype, and while I didn't think it was a bad movie, I felt like I could see a lot more issues with the narrative than other people could. But as time has passed, and the more and more I've watched this film, it's actually substantially grown on me, to the point where those flaws that I had seen before have actually kind of become positives? I will explain. But first, let's talk about Ratatouille's production history, because that plays a part here. The idea for the film was actually created by 
John Pinkova in the year 2000. He began developing the story with Pixar, but after five years, he departed over creative differences. This is when Brad Bird was brought in to replace him. And this is kind of a common thread we're gonna see from Pixar and disgraced executive John Lasseter for a little bit of time here. But Brad Bird is, as previously mentioned, an animation legend, and we'll talk about him one more time in this video. So bringing him into the fold obviously inspired confidence for the direction of the film. Bird took the existing development work and rewrote the script and story entirely. My issue with this film was always that I felt like you could sort of see how Brad Bird had Frankenstein together a bunch of different people's ideas that ultimately became the current Ratatouille script. It felt like a lot of disparate concepts and elements tied together. Even just the various narrative devices used, you start the movie with the typical, well you're probably wondering how I got here freeze frame into flashback. <laughs> As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a rat chef. You've got that narration to help drive the story forward, which then dips in and out of the movie at seemingly random intervals. And you've also got this Gusto ghost acting as Remy's conscience and guide for him to talk to in scenes where he's alone, which when combined with the existing Remy narration, it felt a bit like a hat on a hat to me. Even the narratives themselves felt so separate and so wildly different. You've got the entire rat narrative, this character who dreams of more than life as a rat typically offers. You've got this whole restaurant ownership and unknown heir storyline. Linguini is a co-lead who isn't introduced until 20 minutes into the movie. Not to mention the absolutely absurd suspension of disbelief you need just to buy into the whole rat puppeteering a human being by pulling their hair storyline. Plus, the whole review war between dastardly food critic Anton Ego and Gusto's restaurant. It just truly feels like, on paper, none of these things should work together. Almost nothing about it makes any sense. And yet, the fact that this film is made up of all of these disparate elements and manages to coalesce into such an emotionally satisfying narrative is exactly the magic of Ratatouille. It ties so beautifully to the very ideas behind the film and to the manner in which it was produced. Look at this first scene where Remy cooks in Gusto's kitchen. Linguini messes up the soup and haphazardly throws a bunch of random junk in there to try and salvage it. Now, imagine this as a metaphor for the starting point for Ratatouille as a film. There are some good ideas, some nice flavors, but they haven't been properly emphasized or honed in on in the preparation process. And so Remy, aka Brad Bird, swoops in and finds the exact right ingredients to accentuate what is already in the pot. And what's in the pot might not make the most sense to go together. It's a lot of different ideas, but with the right spices, the right herbs, the right additions to that recipe, it can bring those different ideas together and against all odds, make a delicious soup. You might look at that soup recipe and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like I look at all of the different narrative elements to Ratatouille and say the exact same thing. But the fact is that when all of these ideas finally come together in the big finale of the film, it tastes pretty damn good. The entire climax and resolution of the film fits this idea beautifully. Remy's family supporting his dream by becoming the kitchen support staff, Linguini letting go of his ego and giving Remy his credit, Colette's realization that she lost sight of the idea that anyone can cook, and Remy, of course, getting the opportunity to truly prove this idea. In a way, when I previously looked down on this film, I was Anton Eco. I was hypercritical of its structure and narrative devices and disparate story decisions, but when I truly took a bite and tasted what Ratatouille had to offer, it reminded me that those things don't always matter if the result is something worthwhile. Even Anton Ego's absolutely beautiful review at the end of the film, one of my favorite speeches in film history if I'm being honest, helps drive these ideas home. When you describe the plot of Ratatouille, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. A rat puppeteering a human to be a chef in a Parisian restaurant, just like how in the film they had to describe that very idea to Anton himself, and yet, when he describes his experience. To say that both the meal and its maker have challenged my preconceptions about fine cooking is a gross understatement. The way these seemingly incompatible ideas come together to form something beautiful did exactly that. It challenged my preconceptions. And the fact that this film was cobbled together from all of these different ingredients ties in almost shockingly well in one more important way. It's basically what Ratatouille itself is. In the film, they call it a peasant's dish, but it was basically a food that was created as a solution for hunger centuries ago, where French peasants would create a stew out of all of their leftover vegetables, whatever they had. This movie was created by taking the leftover elements of another story and turning it into a hearty, delicious stew that has fed the body and minds of people for years now. I adore Ratatouille because nothing about it makes sense, and yet everything about it makes sense. It's an incredible film.
The first act of WALL-E is one of the greatest pieces of animation in all of history. Full stop. A case could even be made that it's also one of the best film sequences of any genre since that movie where the train comes at the screen and scares you in 1896. It is absolutely astonishing how efficiently they build this world and tell the beginning of this story with almost no dialogue. We instantly see the state of the earth and through the environmental storytelling infer that corporate by and large absolutely decimated the entire planet. Across the entire first act, every single piece of industry is owned by that chain. Though my favorite detail is later in the movie when we see the head of by and large is the global CEO and we also see him speaking from a near replica of the White House press room, this time with by and large branding. If this were a different type of video, I'd probably have about 5,000 things to say about how this is just Amazon and it needs to be stopped before we all get wall but this is a video about movies, not the actual destruction of Earth. But what I love most is how instantly we get to know wall -E and how unbelievably expressive he is as a character even without dialogue. Simply put, he's just the littlest guy. He is so well defined, so quickly. We obviously learn what his original purpose is and that he's the last of his kind, but most importantly, we see that he's a romantic. He has countless keepsakes and trinkets he finds while working. He watches old movies and craves connection. He's sweet and nurturing. We even see him care for his cockroach friend. Simply through his eyepiece rotations and hand movements, you fully understand his feelings and state of mind. It's just some of my favorite visual storytelling ever. And then they introduce Eve, and it gets even better. Wally's fascination with and observation of Eve is so cute. But most importantly, their introduction brilliantly showcases personality from both robots. Wally excitedly showing Eve all of his trinkets and his movies is just unfathomably charming. Seeing Eve laugh and break out of her directive to enjoy these moments with Wally, I truly think the first act is the best thing Pixar has ever made, and one of my favorite pieces of animation of all time. No exaggeration. The lighter shot is simply perfect, as Eve observes the beauty of the flame while Wally slowly looks from from the fire to Eve herself, amazed and enchanted by each, but clearly more so by Eve. Mm -hmm. Chef's kiss. Unfortunately, while the rest of the movie is still quite excellent, it never reaches the heights of Act 1, which is just on another level, to be fair. Which, I guess, is my one real issue with Wally. It starts so unbelievably strong and cannot quite live up through to the end. But there is a ton to love about the back half as well. What I love most about the second and third acts of the film are how Wally is, well, lack for a better term, a. Sorry, and though he's really just there to save Eve, Wally's infiltration of the space crews changes everything. His dirt contamination forces the little cleaning bot off of his track. His interactions with John and Mary get them both to stop staring at their screens and actually observe and appreciate the world they live in. Wally introducing himself to the captain gets dirt on his hand, which leads him to research the Earth and get excited about the possibility of returning. The entire space station was in this completely automated state, and thanks to Wally, they're given an opportunity to start over, to do things for themselves. And it's hard not to love the ending, as Eve desperately races to get Wally home and fixed before he shuts off forever. Wally is a really special film, some of Pixar's best without a doubt. It's not my favorite Pixar film, but its first act is probably my favorite thing Pixar has ever made. Hey, I can see your house from here! <laughs> Don't check around so much, kid! Whoa. Ah! Well, that's not gonna work. I feel like Up is a slightly divisive Pixar entry. I don't really know anyone who outright dislikes it, but I do feel like I know a lot of people who think it's overrated. It was actually my favorite Pixar movie for years, and I still quite like it, but I don't have as much adoration for it as I used to. That being said, Up is an excellent film. Obviously, the entire opening sequence is undeniable. Just such incredible economic storytelling, limiting dialogue to the parts when Carl and Ellie are kids, and really highlighting Giacchino's outstanding score for the montage through their lives together. Man, is that score unbelievable, rightfully won the Oscar. The film is obviously obviously infamous for this opening sequence and making the audience weep in the first 20 minutes of the film, but it's all done in service of the story to come. I've seen a lot of people with a sort of why would they manipulate us like this sentiment, but the rest of the film wouldn't hit nearly as hard if we didn't fully understand the magnitude of Carl's loss. Also, manipulation? You do know that movies are sometimes sad, right? If we didn't understand Carl's full life arc in the beginning, we wouldn't be able to fully grasp
grasp how hard it was for him to let go. Somehow Carl remains endearing throughout, despite being the ultimate curmudgeon, and I think it's simply because we experienced all he went through to get to that place. He is so, so focused on completing his adventure with Ellie that he sort of ignores the new adventure that presents itself, the new connections he's making along the way, the new reason to live. Carl warming up to Russell over the film feels fully earned, realizing that Russell has also lost somebody close to him, his father, but in a very different way. I loved this moment in particular, the one that needed to get through to Carl the most, as Russell reminisces on his favorite memories with his father. Now, it might sound boring, but I think the boring stuff is the stuff I remember the most. And obviously, this is also the reality of Carl's relationship with Ellie. He felt he had let her down because he promised to take her to Paradise Falls and never did. But in reality, Ellie lived her best, happiest life with Carl. No scene is more satisfying than Carl realizing that Ellie filled up her adventure book with photos of their life together. And Carl realizing that his next adventure was in front of him the entire time. He's already formed this entirely newfound family with Russell, Doug, and Kevin. I particularly love that Carl has to literally throw everything from his life with Ellie out in order for the house to float again so that he can save Russell. Just really great thematic storytelling, letting go of all of that baggage so that he can embrace that new connection, but in this case, quite literally. When this movie hits, it hits. The emotional through lines are undeniable. That being said, there are aspects that I am not as in love with. While I do enjoy Doug, it's so funny watching this years later and realizing how much this influenced millennial humor. I found this stuff super funny when it released, but all these years later, I found myself cringing quite a bit, which I guess isn't the film's fault. But in general, the army of talking dogs is the one aspect of this thing that I just can't really get behind. There are certainly funny moments, but it just feels so so ridiculous and out there that it takes me out of the story a little bit. Which is saying a lot in a film about a man flying his house to South America with thousands of balloons. But when the dogs start flying fighter planes, sorry, I cannot help but roll my eyes. It feels like a scene from a completely different movie that got scrapped and sold for parts. Well, Dogfighter is dead in the water. Any other movies we can shoehorn these assets into? Speaking of those balloons though, I will never get over how stunning and striking the visual is. Especially just seeing the house floating through the gorgeous gorgeous blue skies above the clouds. Truly one of my favorite pieces of iconography in animation history. This is another that I actually watched in 3D recently, and man, I cannot say enough about how mesmerizing those balloons are with a little added depth. Up is mostly excellent. It tells an emotionally grounded story, despite its characters being in such a ridiculous adventure setting. Yeah, the iconography and the locations are amazing and unforgettable, but there's a reason why what people remember most about this film are the emotional moments. Despite a couple misgivings, I really love this one. Man, Toy Story is without a doubt one of the most consistently great franchises in history. It feels weird that Toy Story 3 was the first of the franchise to be nominated for this award, since it originated in 2001, but let's be honest, this easily would have been their third nomination if Best Animated Feature came around six years earlier, and we'd probably be sick of it by now. Like how some people are tired of all those Meryl Streep nominations. Not me though, I love Meryl. And Toy Story. For a while, Toy Story 3 felt like a film that would never get made. In fact, when Pixar and Disney were in the throes of potentially parting ways, Disney was set to maintain the rights and intended on making their own Toy Story 3 without Pixar. In one early version of the script, the toys would find themselves in a whodunit style mystery at Andy's grandma's house, which is not unlike the eventual story for the Toy Story of Terror special, which is actually quite good. The next version of the script, which was always the rumor I heard when I was younger, was that Buzz would be recalled to a factory in Taiwan and the other toys would travel to rescue him, which is maybe a little bit of a Toy Story 2 rehash if we're being honest. But in 2006, Disney bought Pixar and developed an original idea that would become the Toy Story 3 we know. And it's hard to imagine imagine them doing a better job with the third installment. It hit me particularly hard having grown up on the first two films and having been right around Andy's age for the third. It felt like I grew up alongside him. But the magic of these films is how damn effectively they build and expand on the previous film's themes. I think what I adore most about this franchise is though they're kids movies about toys, they're incredibly existential. Every film is about coping with the changes or impending changes in our lives. They're about the ebbs and flows of our most important connections in every single stage of those relationships, about embracing 
embracing the love in those connections, even if it isn't going to last forever, and to accept when it's time to move forward. Each film has Woody moving into a new era of his life, and Toy Story 3 is one of the biggest changes, as Andy prepares for college and toys prepare for the unknown. While Woody is grappled with the eventual loss of Andy, this is obviously the first time he's dealt with the prospect so closely. The entire film, he's convinced that they all need to get back home to basically live out their lives in the attic. Their lives, of course, being eternal. An eternity in the attic. He's accepted that there will be change, but he's so committed to Andy that he's okay with everyone living this unhappy life, as long as it's adjacent to the life he used to know. A shell of his former life. Which circle of hell is that? Woody has to learn that though his time with Andy was important, he and his friends are going to live a fuller, more rewarding life if they accept that that time is over now. That many of them will get an entirely new lease on life via Bonnie. And they tell this story so effectively. Bonnie discovering and playing with Woody is such an amazing sequence. One of the greatest things about these movies is that even when the toys' expressions are neutral, we project their feelings onto them depending on the circumstances. Just like we did when we played with toys as kids. You can tell that Woody is so happy being played with for the first time in years, even though his expression is completely wooden. One of the smaller aspects I love about this film is the way they show the different ways kids can play. We see early on that Andy mostly tells stories with his toys, but when we see Bonnie playing with her toys, she incorporates herself into those stories. She plays a character interacting with the other toys. It's very cute. This film is also so clever and even manages to be super emotional through those clever choices. Starting the film with a cinematic action sequence of all the toys during playtime, referencing the playtimes we've seen in the previous films. I love the montage of Andy playing with his toys over the years set to You've Got a Friend in Me, but of course, ending the song early and much more emotionally. A friendship will never die kind of haunting, to be honest. It's also so funny. I have no idea how they came up with Tortilla Frankenstein, Mr. Potato Head, but that is inspired. And Ken has got to be one of the best additions to the franchise. His fashion show is one of the funniest things to come out of any of these movies. If I were to criticize the film at all, I'd say that Lotso being a twist villain with misgivings about how he was treated as a toy is maybe a tad too much of a rehash from the villain Stinky Pete in Toy Story 2. And while it's absolutely so fun and a joy to watch, the whole Toy Story jailbreak story at the daycare maybe feels a bit removed from the more important aspects of this story. But these are honestly minor complaints because these things all still worked really well and were really fun to watch. We all know that the Toy Story movies can feel a tad emotionally manipulative. At this point in the franchise, the Disney shareholders expect an increase in viewer tiers each fiscal quarter, so it's to be expected. But those emotional moments always hit. The trash incinerator scene is maybe a bit dark, but the look on those toys' faces as they all hold hands and accept that even if this is the end, they're going to get there together, really touching. But nothing is more powerful than the final scene, when Andy gives his toys to Bonnie. The way he pulls back Woody before realizing it's time to let him go, the way he plays with them all one last time before he leaves, and I think most impactfully, the way Bonnie makes Woody wave at Andy to say goodbye. Just a spectacularly perfect ending to the film. Toy Story 3 actually isn't my favorite of the franchise, but it is a superb film in a superb franchise. There's a reason this was also nominated for Best Picture. I don't want to get married. I want to stay single and let my hair flow in the wind as I ride through the glen. Similar to Ratatouille, Brave was another Pixar film with a bit of a troubled production history. Originally helmed by Brenda Chapman, director of The Prince of Egypt, Brave aimed to be Pixar's first real fairy tale. However, mid-production, disgraced animator John Lasseter opted to replace Brenda Chapman with Mark Andrews, though it seems like this mid-production replacement was not as effective as Ratatouille. That being said, while I certainly think it has issues, I don't dislike Brave as much as a lot of other folks. With that being said, can we talk about how this is another Disney film where a character turns into a bear? Two nickels, weird it happened twice etc. But I do think this is fundamentally a pretty strong story, even if it meanders and has missteps along the way. The focus on the strained relationship between Merida and her mother mostly works. The deep-seated conflict between Merida's ambition and their culture's expectations. Not new territory by any means, but I appreciate their focus on that failure to communicate. The failure to get through to each other on any level when they both hold their beliefs so dearly. Eleanor's transformation into a bear forces the pair to truly learn how to communicate more fundamentally, without being able to actually speak to each other. They have to actually learn to understand each other. And while I don't think it quite fully fleshes this idea out as much as I'd like, there are some really great moments along the way. Plus, this time, nobody had to kill anybody's bear mom. They were close, though. The sequence where they're fishing together in the river is probably my favorite, and the little game of charades they have to play is sweet. And while I wish we maybe got a bit more between the pair in this chunk of the film, the ending still is effective. With Merida risking her life and saving her mother from her father and the rest of the tribes, and with Eleanor returning the favor and risking her life to save Merida from Mordu. 
cannot lie, I got emotional during Merida's desperate pleas for her mother to return to her before the second sunrise that would leave her a bear forever. The biggest moments of the film, they mostly hit for me. But it's still pretty frustrating given that these moments could have had an even bigger impact had I connected to the rest of the film a bit more, had that arc had a bit more substance. I felt like it was maybe one or two additional story beats from really feeling complete. I'm also not a huge fan of any of the supporting cast, none of the other tribes folks were particularly funny, I really found myself checked out during the sequences that focused on them. I also felt the world itself was a bit underwhelming, the magic, the lore, the history, like I said, underwhelming. And I know that Mark Andrews reeled a lot of the magical aspects that Brenda Chapman had focused on in. I can understand not wanting to distract from the core of the story, but if it makes your world ultimately feel generic, I question the decision. Brave is another one of those films that feels a bit like wasted potential. There is a lot that works, but it's so clear that it could have been a stronger film. Combine that with the production woes, and it's a frustrating film despite its strengths. But you know, it's probably the only Disney film where a baby bear dives into a woman's cleavage, unless they finally greenlit my feature script bare necessities come fly with me gachinha <sighs> Inside Out marks Pete Docter's third nomination for Best Animated Feature, and many consider this to be his magnum opus, as well as among Pixar's best. While I do like Inside Out, I definitely don't love it as much as others do. I think it's easy to sort of cynically criticize Inside Out because of Pixar's storytelling tendencies and evolution as a studio. Oh, they gave toys, monsters, fish, and rats emotions? What's next, giving emotions emotions? <laughs> thank you, thank you, I'll be here all week. While I do sort of see where that cynicism comes from, that's not really the issue I have here. The primary setting of Inside Out is probably the best thing about it. I really love the way the mind of each character is portrayed, and the idea that memories often reflect specific emotions, the way core memories shape who we are. I even love the detail that each person will often have a different emotion as the lead. For Riley, Joy runs the show, but for Riley's mom, it was sadness, and for her dad, Louis Black. Can I say that curse word now? There is a ton of creativity in the portrayal of inner turmoil through these emotions, how these emotions interact with each other and with our memories, how happy memories can change to sad memories based on how life around you changes. It almost feels like there was more they could have explored just in regards to how we interact with our memories. Even just the idea that a character is actually the setting gives this film an entirely unique flavor that you can't get elsewhere, and I actually really related to Riley's angst in this film. A lot of the things she dealt with were things that I went through as a kid, and when you're at that sort of tween age time in your life, these kinds of life changes feel earth shattering. That went a long way to help the overall dilemma feel realistic and relatable to me, but the movie starts to lose me a bit the deeper into Riley they dive. It's all certainly very creative. The train of thought, the long-term memory storage, the memory dump, the dream movie studio, abstract thought, but I feel like the more of these ideas they tried to tie together, the less cohesive the metaphor became. Which honestly, I can forgive to a degree. It's a big concept. But I also just found a lot of the middle of the film to be a bit boring. Just like a series of various kinds of chase sequences strung together as Joy and Sadness try to get back to headquarters. By the final sequence where Joy was chasing Sadness around, I was just kind of exhausted by it. Okay, now I'm gonna say something that's going to get me fully cancelled. I did not much care about Bing Bong. <laughs> <laughs> I am typically fully on board for whatever emotional roller coaster Pixar wants to put me on, and I did enjoy Richard Kind's performance and the way he tied to Riley's childhood, but I just did not buy into the overly dramatic self-sacrifice. I'm sorry! It's something that feels like it should work on me, and I quite like the idea of Bing Bong representing this part of Riley's childhood that she has to leave behind. I just didn't feel like that was really what Riley's internal struggle was about. I guess it was more about Joy's connection to those happy times in Riley's childhood, and helping her realize she's going to need to relinquish control as Riley gets older and moves away from that childlike wonder. I understand its place in the story, but the way this sequence is executed just doesn't do much for me. I swear I'm not a monster, I've cried during so many of these movies. The end of the film, however, is undeniable. I think the core journey for Joy and Sadness and their conflict within Riley is what really works about Inside Out. Joy's realization that sadness isn't a bad thing, it's an important means of expression, and that it can lead to healing and, yes, happiness. The climax absolutely gets the tears flowing for me. Joy allowing sadness to take the lead, and Riley finally being able to express the things she's felt she needed to keep inside leading to a stronger bond with her family. That's just really beautiful stuff. Inside Out is a very good film. I just don't think it's the masterpiece many others do. In fact, it might be my least favorite Pete Docter film, which is obviously a very high bar, and I'll reassess after I rewatch Soul, but Inside Out is a film I want to love, but just mostly really like. It's brimming with creativity, relatability, and great messaging, but it just doesn't quite feel like the complete package for me.
Anything to declare? Uh, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> Hola. In my opinion, Coco is Pixar's last masterpiece. For now, hopefully. But man, I have just always adored this film. Honestly, I saw it twice in theaters and hadn't seen it in the years since, and so going into this rewatch, I was maybe slightly concerned it wouldn't live up to my memories. But oh boy, was I happy to be proven wrong. And what more fitting way to reaffirm memories of something I love than with a film about holding on to the memories of the people we love. They sell the family dynamics so perfectly right out the gate. You fully understand why this family is resisting into anything musical, even though you disagree with it, and you see how that controlling nature leads to Miguel beginning to resent that family. The entire journey through the afterlife so beautifully explores this conflict, allowing Miguel to open up and recognize the importance of family, alongside his family recognizing that enforcing their own trauma responses on subsequent generations isn't healthy or sustainable for their family. And don't even get me started on the visuals of this film. I truly think The Land of the Dead is one of the most beautiful, inspired locations in animation history. Just an app absolute splendor to look at. And beyond the general landscape and layering, the architecture and details within are stunning as well. This sort of entryway station is clearly designed after the Bradbury building in downtown Los Angeles, and the expansion of that interior in this otherworldly setting is so inspired. I think the fact that there's such excellent music throughout goes a long way for me as well. Any film that narratively connects with great music tends to tug at my heartstrings in just the right way. And in particular, the way they seed Remember Me throughout this film is so ingeniously executed. First showcasing it it as the more upbeat and beloved song performed by De La Cruz, and even showing various different renditions by other performers at the talent show. You're familiar with the song thanks to these perfectly paced little snippets, and then the recontextualization changes everything. First Hector playing for Little Coco, revealing the true nature of the song, and of course Miguel performing one last time for the older Coco. I cry during both of these performances, but for that final performance, my face just leaks water. I turn into a faucet in disrepair, a landlord needs to be called, fully ruined pipes, ceiling collapse imminent. In my opinion, it's the most beautiful culminating moment in Pixar history. While there are countless deeply emotional sequences throughout their filmography, I don't think any one of them brings every aspect of a story together as masterfully as this one. Miguel finally embracing the importance of creating and holding on to those family memories, Coco getting a chance to relive the happiest moments of her childhood, the entire family finally understanding not only the beautiful memories that music can enhance, but the truth about their family history, and of course, Hector's songwriting legacy and memory being preserved so that he gets the chance to see his daughter and love his family once again, through a song called Remember Me, no less. I think Coco is peak Pixar, a perfect film. <laughs> oh my god. Maybe I'm putting too much stock in online discourse, but Incredibles 2 has got to be one of the most overhated films in the Pixar library. And I fully believe that's for two reasons. One, it had to follow up an absolute masterpiece, and two, fans waited 14 years for that follow up. Of course, that's going to create unreasonable levels of hype. But the reality is, is that Incredibles 2 is a great film. No, it's not quite as good as the first, and I'll go over why, but it nails everything a good sequel needs to do. It expands on the messages and themes of the first, it expands the world beyond the scope of the first, and it absolutely ups the ante on action and in scale. I'm gonna be honest, the hate for this thing kinda baffles me. I think it's a really great time. I've seen some people claim that it undoes everything the first achieves, which... No. Based on everything we know about this world, there was no reason to assume that the government would just accept supers back into the world, no questions asked. And making a movie specifically about the transitional period, showing the activists who are fighting for supers' rights to return to the public, that's a perfect continuation of the previous film. It's the natural place to take the story. It places the world in a period of change, and it puts the main characters in a super challenging position. The focus on Elastigirl as the primary super in this film is great, and honestly, is one of the reasons that the action is actually improved, despite the first film having some excellent action to begin with. The opening Underminer fight has an unbelievable sense of scale. Elastigirl's high-speed chase of the monorail through New Urbum is one of the coolest, most creative chase sequences I've ever seen. The super's attack on the house has such an amazing variety and combination of characters and abilities. It's just so much fun. It's great to see Elastigirl get the spotlight, but also struggle internally over whether or not they're going about this the right way. And I love the way this puts Bob in the mystery 
sister mom role. His chemistry with his kids was always a highlight in the first film, and that dynamic is obviously super important to these films. Sure, they're action superhero films, but they're just as much family dramas. Bob struggling to adapt to his role as caretaker while Helen makes ends meet is a great challenge for him and allows him to connect with his kids in ways he hasn't in years. The look of satisfaction on his face when he helps Dash with his math, the desperate attempts to make things right with Violet after Tony gets men in blacked, the uncertainty with Jack-Jack's rapidly developing powers, it really ups the ante in the family drama department. Bob is being beaten down in an entirely new way. He's used to being strong enough to handle everything that comes his way, but he's being confronted by dilemmas and challenges he's never really comprehended. Learning you can't punch your way through fatherhood. I'm used to knowing what the right thing to do is, but now I'm not sure anymore. I just want to be a good dad. Honestly, I think Incredibles 2 is as funny, if not funnier, than the first as well. Jack-Jack vs. the Raccoon is easily one of my favorite scenes in Pixar history. Really, everything revolving around Jack-Jack's abilities delivers some of the best physical humor and biggest laughs in the series. Obviously, the one big downgrade from the first film is the villain. The idea behind Screen Slaver is cool enough, but the commentary is a little on the nose, and the identity twist was one of the most predictable in recent Disney history. She simply did not have as strong of an origin or motivation as syndrome. And while I do love the expansion of the world, I wish the new generation of supers introduced in this film had a bit more substance. It feels like they start to try and flesh out Void, and then accidentally left her whole deal in a previous draft of the script. And overall, it does feel like the emotional core of the first film is much stronger. There's nothing that really lives up to Bob's fear that he's lost his family and relief when he finds them alive. But I adore the way Dash and Violet have to rise to the occasion to save their parents. I wish it had been seated a bit more than just in the opening scene, but this film naturally continues their journeys as supers, not just embracing their powers in the key moments like in the first film, but taking the initiative to save the day. They are in trouble. It's up to us. To us. Understand? And being validated in that decision, a nice full circle moment following the opening fight. Oh, sweetie. How could I be mad? I'm proud. And just like the first, we're treated to an amazing team showdown as the family syncs up and this time takes on an entire array of supers together, putting aside their egos to embrace the exact roles they're needed for in the suspenseful final set piece. Incredibles 2 is not the masterpiece that the first is, it isn't as complete of a film, but it is absolutely a strong sequel and definitely overhated. To infinity. Ah, Toy Story 4, the least necessary Toy Story sequel since Toy Story 3, which was the least necessary Toy Story sequel since Toy Story 2. It's almost as though sequels are almost never necessary and simply build on the themes and ideas presented in the previous films. And guess what? No matter how badly a five-hour rant video can misunderstand the source material, Toy Story 4 is an excellent film. Unreasonably good, if I'm being honest. Obviously, like many, I was skeptical that they could continue the franchise in a satisfying way after Toy Story 3, but because of the nature of Toy Story 4's production, I always held out a bit of hope. The development itself actually started before Toy Story 3 even released, and was allegedly kept a secret even from much of the higher Pixar brass. Disgraced animator John Lasseter and co. maintained that the only reason they even considered an additional sequel is because they were so inspired by this idea, and though the project ended up changing many times over its production, I think this is a testament to the fact that they wanted to make sure they got it right. It was never being developed for a quick buck, no matter how many people want to claim it was. You don't take 10 years to make a movie for a quick buck. Save that criticism for Toy Story 5, which unfortunately does feel much more like a pure money-making endeavor, but I guess we'll see. While this film seems to be appreciated by most fans of the franchise, there are definitely many vocal haters who don't seem to shut up about it, and I cannot relate to those people any less. Toy Story 4 is the continuation I didn't know I needed, an amazing expansion of Woody's story built brilliantly upon the themes of the first three, and frankly, it's the first film to really reconcile with the ramifications of a world where toys are sentient beings. Obviously, Obviously, it's easy to say these films are about talking toys because kids love toys, but what makes them special is the underlying ideas that make them relatable to even the adults who are dragged to the theater by their kids. And the themes for all of these films are deeply existential. Effectively, this is a franchise about navigating the many transitional stages in our lives and the existential dread and crises that come with that navigation. As far back as the very first film being about Woody's fears and insecurities when his relationship to his best friend starts to change, and the selfish mistakes he makes to try 
try and hold on to that exact relationship, being unwilling to accept how his life is going to shift and evolve. Toy Story is all about adapting to these changes. Toy Story 2 focuses on Woody considering life beyond Andy and whether or not he should just move forward before the natural end. Toy Story 3 is about Woody struggling with the reality of the end of that relationship while actively going through it. These films primarily focus on Woody holding on to a previous worldview too closely, to the point where it's detrimental to himself and those around him. In the first film, his jealousy nearly kills Buzz and would have lost Andy's new favorite toy. In the second, he nearly abandoned Andy and his friends out of fear of his eventual rejection. And in three, he tried to force all of his friends to live out the rest of their days in the attic out of loyalty to Andy, despite better options for a more fulfilling life laid out before them. Toy Story 4 kind of perfectly escalates this pattern, through Woody experiencing an entirely foreign stage of his life, in a role he struggles to adapt to. He's no longer the sheriff in a kid's room. He's no longer a favorite toy. Woody is so used to being the support pillar for both his kid and his friends, he doesn't know what to do with himself when this isn't his role. And he desperately tries to fit himself into that role, despite not being the natural fit for this new kid. It's that classic single-mindedness that Woody succumbs to in every single one of these films. Here, he is convinced he has to play that important role in Bonnie's life, so he sneaks away to school with her to make sure she's okay. He helps her with her arts and crafts project, which turns out to be her new favorite toy, this dumbass fork who doesn't even know what money is. He spends every waking minute making sure Forky doesn't throw himself away, but what he fails to see is that he's just not one of Bonnie's favorite toys, and desperately forcing himself into this supportive role when Bonnie is just not that into you is not a healthy or sustainable way to live, which is why the reintroduction of Bo works so beautifully. In the first two films, she was always the most sensible and pragmatic of the toys. When Woody was panicked, she was there to reassure him that things could work out. She's much better at rolling with the punches and taking things as they come, and so it makes so much sense that as she got older and more worn down, and found herself in a place where there wasn't much interest in a toy like her anymore, she adjusted. She started living life for herself because she recognized that that was the stage she was in. Just like all of us as we age and find ourselves in new stages of life, Woody had to acknowledge that his days as a beloved toy were over, and that it was time to find a new way to live, a new way to be happy. He's like a basketball player who can't cut it on the court anymore, so he retires and becomes a coach. Woody's core belief is that loving and being loved by a kid is the greatest thing a toy can do, and this is still true. It's why he gives up his voice box and helps Gabby Gabby find a person to love her. It's why in the end credits, his new gang is rescuing toys from carnival games and finding them homes. The reality is that Bonnie just didn't love Woody like Andy did, and that's okay. She is a five-year-old child. Young kids are fickle. They have different interests. Nobody loves their toys forever. These are the kinds of variables that we all deal with in life. And in this late stage in his life, Bo helps Woody see that there isn't just one way to live. The film is beautifully bookended by these two sequences. When Bo is first taken away, Woody holds onto this box and he considers getting lost with her. This wasn't his time though. Andy still needed him and he stayed behind. And in this final sequence, Woody once again has his hands placed in the same way, looking back at Bo, questioning whether or not he really should be saying goodbye. And nine years later, it is finally his time. He's done all he can to help Bonnie and it's time for him to move on. I don't think Toy Story 4 is perfect. The classic toys get super sidelined and they sort of dumb buzz down a bit too much, but the core ideas and the ending of Toy Story 4 are so beautiful. They ingeniously build on the themes of the previous film and they brilliantly expand on what it means to be a toy in a world where toys are sentient. And of course, they once again explore the most important ever-changing stages of our lives through these lovable goddamn toys. It's a miracle and I'm really glad it exists. Dad? Onward is a film I first watched just a couple months into full pandemic lockdown, and honestly, I do not think I was in the right headspace to appreciate a big emotional road trip movie. Because while I remember really appreciating the ending, on rewatch, I was kind of astounded by how much I loved this entire film. Directed by Dan Scanlon, whose first directing credit was the underrated Monsters University, Onward dives into a sort of modernized Dungeons and Dragons type fantasy world, where the inhabitants have forsaken the magic of their ancestors for the convenience brought about by industry and capitalism. The type of place where you might find fantastical creatures with horns and wings working at, like, Jiffy Lube. I am not particularly drawn to the D&D type of fantasy genre. There are plenty of examples of fantasy media that I do adore, but the specific type of stuff you find in the tabletop world has never quite been my thing, so I think I maybe wrote off the world itself a bit too soon. Honestly, I grew to really appreciate the ways they brought that fantasy inspiration into our more modernized society. It's not groundbreaking or anything, but there's obviously real love and passion injected into the world building. I also remember sort of rolling my 
eyes at the Chris Pratt, Tom Holland casting at the time, but I'm happy to eat my words because they are both so good in this. Any of you guys out there defending Chris Pratt's Mario performance with your life? Stop it. Stan Barley, which is actually an outstanding voice performance, and you know, actually makes sense, casting-wise. I do think that remembering the ending of this film and how strong it was emotionally may have impacted this recent viewing. Knowing where it leads, I was fully blown away by how well the story builds itself out, how meaningful every step of the journey actually is when you have the endpoint in mind. On my first watch, it maybe felt like it was a series of random fantasy-inspired events playing out one after another, but when you really see how each and every single event ties into Ian's list, the way the story unfolds is really satisfying. And the emotional core of the story is obviously this relationship between these brothers, and I don't think you see many of those relationships explored the same way in other media. A story that really explicitly places Barley in the role of Ian's surrogate father. If you believe the bridge is there, then it's there. But it's not. Well, not with that attitude. It's honestly a really beautiful bait and switch. I was pining for this beautiful meeting between Ian and his late father. You can imagine how emotional it would have been. And then they hit you with the, oh, you've actually been watching a more beautiful father-son relationship all along. Enjoy this recontextualization and cry. And that realization that Barley's moment with his father is so much more important than Ian meeting him for the first time hits like a ton of bricks. I mean, the entire film, he's even being followed around by one of his only memories of his father, his feet. That's right, Dad. It's me. Barley actually knew their father. He's the one who is still grappling with that unresolved trauma, the regret that he was too scared to say goodbye. And these revelations deliver such a stealthy catharsis, hitting you from an angle you never expected. Honestly, after rewatch, I think this is a deeply underrated Pixar film. This might be the furthest a Pixar has moved up my ranking list on rewatch ever. I think maybe the one aspect of the story I find a bit underwhelming is Laurel and Corey's side plot, trying to track down the boys. It's not bad, it just feels, like I said, underwhelming compared to the rest. At least it gives Tracy Ullman a quick moment to be sketchy as hell, and I appreciate that they tried to tie the subplot into the climax, but it's overshadowed by the main storyline quite a bit. But that climax overall is so great. Ian giving up his chance to see his father so that his brother can make up for his biggest regret in life, and likely the thing that has stunted his growth as a young adult, all while Ian utilizes every single spell and ability that Barley taught him along the way to fight a giant rubble dragon that rings a school bell when it roars? <laughs> This is a good movie, guys. This is a climax where the emotionality and the cool factor intersect seamlessly. It absolutely rips. I can't believe how much I undervalued this film. Out of all 99 films on this list, it's one of the few that I was almost immediately jonesing to watch again. I hope this gets its flowers as time passes because I think its reputation will only get stronger with time. Pete Doctor's fourth and final nomination for Best Animated Feature is Soul, the first film from Pixar to be a full victim of the pandemic, though this one definitely got a good amount of fanfare despite its Disney Plus exclusive release. It sort of felt like their jazzy Christmas present to the world after a particularly harrowing year, and when it came out, I loved this thing. It was easily my favorite Pixar in years and really spoke to me as a creative. The exploration of the spark that inspires us and how that guides us in the way we live our lives. This was the first time I had revisited the film since 2020, and while I did still enjoy it, I've definitely softened on it a bit. For one, watching it within this project where I also just watched Inside Out, there are a lot of aspects that feel a bit re-tready for Doctor. And even just on its face, Doctor had just done the colorful little guys that are actually inside other guys and make them complex story. Just feels too similar. Swapping emotional emotions for bratty souls didn't change the message all that much. That being said, I do think in a lot of ways, Soul handles this in a way that speaks to me a tiny bit more. The idea the idea of core memories is cool, but I think the story lends itself a bit more to a creative mindset that may be prone to hyperfixation, aka me. But the thing that really works for me in this film is pretty much anything set in New York. For the first seven minutes of this, I was convinced it would be the best Pixar film of all time. Just an earnest story of a man living out his dream in New York City, getting the biggest opportunity of his life, absolutely vibing out while playing piano. This thing was speaking to me. But sadly, on this most recent rewatch, I felt a bit exhausted by anything in the great before. It just felt visually so much less interesting than their portrayal of New York, and, as we've talked about before, this is once again a Disney film that takes a black protagonist and removes him from his body. This time, turns him into a little blue dude, and then later, into an actual cat. This is
is a pattern and it's not great, guys. I do think the story as presented works very well. It's honestly an inspiring story about following our dreams and what it actually means to live life. Joe needed to get a literal new perspective on his own life, from the outside looking in to understand the ways he hasn't fully been living, fully connecting to those around him. It's just a shame that it feels like Disney is incapable of having a black protagonist without putting them in an animal body. But despite these issues, I think Soul has a lot to say. I was particularly moved this time by the idea of lost souls, how they're not all that far removed from people who are just fully in the zone with their spark, vibing with what brings them joy, and how being too focused on those things could actually be detrimental, could prevent people from the more important things life has to offer. I don't know, not entirely sure why I connected with this as I watched the 94th movie for my 7 hour video analysis, who's to say? It's a mystery. Soul is a very nice film, even if it continues some frustrating Disney trends and maybe feels a bit too safe for Pete Doctor after Inside Out, it still spoke to me in a very real way and is an excellent watch. I guess that's how humans swim? Ugh, that's embarrassing. This was actually a Pixar film I missed. I was kind of disappointed by the prospect of having to watch it on Disney Plus instead of in the theater. But now that I've finally seen it, I'm pretty upset that I hadn't watched it sooner because this is truly an excellent film. I think these Disney Plus releases have done these films a massive disservice, and I think this one drew the shortest straw. Soul was the first released and got people talking. Turning Red had a lot of uh, weird discourse surrounding it, but it still got people buzzing. I don't really see anybody talking about Luca, and that is a shame. First up, the setting is absolutely gorgeous, a stunning Italian coastal town. It's the kind of place you picture when you think of a dream vacation. But I also adored how different they went with the character designs on this one. The models have way less of your typical Pixar face. They almost feel like a nice blend of Pixar style and the Aardman, Wallace, and Gromit type body shapes. Rounder and more cartoony. They work really great in this world. The highlight of this film is absolutely the connection between Luca and Alberto. I see a lot of people complain that they wanted this film to be gayer, and I do understand that, but honestly, this film is pretty gay. I totally get wanting more explicit representation, super valid, but the friendship formed between Luca and Alberto absolutely plays out like young infatuation. It's really heartwarming seeing them connect. Plus, there's your standard jealousy issues when Luca connects with Julia and bonds with her over school and the prospect of learning. I mean, if you still don't see it, I don't understand how there's any other way to interpret this ending. The running after the train trope is pretty explicitly romantic. Not to mention the parallels that Luca's family wanting to send him away have with so many experiences for unsupported LGBTQ youth, as well as Portoroso's town's unfounded fear of sea monsters and the way the characters are outed against their will. I truly just found this story charming beginning to end. The characters are so likable, driven by excellent performances. Ercole was a perfectly obnoxious villain, just a caricature of an annoying Italian teenager. Hey, <gasps> stop looking. She's too beautiful for you. The way Julia finds her missing community in Luca and Alberto, the way their inclusion enriches the life of Julia's father, Massimo, who affectionately stands up for the boys after they've been outed as sea monsters, which is particularly impactful as Massimo sort of embodies the stoic masculine energy traditionally associated with homophobia, yet he's still fully supportive of the thing that the rest of the town fears. They are... The winners! Convention busted, good sir. Convention busted. And in typical Pixar fashion, I was in full tears at the emotional ending, as Alberto gives up his own dreams and the promise of prolonged time with Luca so that Luca can fulfill his own dreams of going to school. Just a beautiful and touching story. Deeply underrated. Deeper than the dang ocean, even. Yeah, I just love this film front to back. <laughs> Turning Red, a Pixar film that was surrounded by totally normal discourse when it released. This was the feature directorial debut of Domi Shi, who is now a creative vice president alongside Andrew Stanton, Peter Sohn, and Dan Scanlon, and this was a strong feature debut, set in Toronto in the early 2000s. That's just after 9-11, if you're mysterious. Focusing on 13-year-old May and her relationship with her overbearing mother, Ming, which is definitely the core relationship in the film. But obviously, the big hook is May's sudden ability to turn into a giant red panda when she gets emotional. I truly just loved this story conceptually, to portray that hormonal, emotional, pubescent time in a kid's life as this actual massive monster that emerges, the fluffiest puberty hulk. I really appreciate the way the film portrayed the volatile nature of this mother-daughter relationship at that age. Not only the difficulties May has adjusting to a changing body, but how her relationship with her mother evolves, how Ming, who has previously maintained a tighter control over her daughter's life, has to relent in order for May to become her own person, alongside Ming's own trauma from her experience with her own 
mother, and how that relationship has defined her and Mei's relationship. I particularly liked the implication that Ming's more violent panda persona was the cause of her mother's scar on her eye, just some really unique and heavy backstory that is shown, not told. It's just a very solidly conveyed personal story, clearly defined by director Shi's experience as a young immigrant in Toronto. I also loved the time period, setting it in 2002 and even focusing on the boy band craze that was still permeating the culture at the time. I really think it captured the vibe of that era, and focusing on a giant red panda kaiju sequence for the climax, that's very Johnny coded. And I especially loved the film's choice to let Mei keep her red panda, rather than banish it like the rest of the women in her family. I think they did such a cool job roping in so many metaphors about growing up, particularly in regards to these familial relationships. The idea that while it may be important to acknowledge tradition, times change, and forcing people into these rigid boxes and structures just as they're figuring out who they are can be super unhealthy, as showcased by Ming's own relationship with her mother. I love seeing them break those cycles. Turning Red is a very solid Pixar movie. I had a nice time with it, and I rate it 9 out of 11. I gotta say, I was pretty happy to see Elemental's box office comeback after such an awful start. Pixar had this really long string of originals, and two of the most popular were denied theatrical releases because of the pandemic. It would have been a huge bummer if their first since just fully bombed. It was nice to see that it had legs, and hopefully makes originals continue to seem viable for Disney, especially because, currently, the future looks incredibly sequel-filled. That being said, I did not particularly connect to Elemental. There are some qualities I really admire, particularly the animation. Like, these character models are just mind-blowing. The way they both feel like fully formed rigs and also particle effects, the physics are insane. The city itself also looks stunning. There are seriously so, so many gorgeous sequences, and the persistent use of fire and water make for some unbelievable animation. But I really struggled to get into the story. The first half in particular I found pretty boring. I also found Wade to be insufferable at first. Absolutely loathed everything he did when he was introduced. Why was he so intent on reporting the Lumen's business at first? Dude went so far out of his way to avoid listening to anything Ember had to say, and then the moment he reported them, he listened and regretted it. If he was so easy to convince, why was it so difficult to convince him just to talk? Truly made me hate the guy. And like, the entire premise of this movie is that Wade effortlessly connects to people. I just can't help but think that would have been more effective if I didn't fucking hate him. I do think it started to find itself in the back half. Once Ember and Wade actually connect and go on their date, I emotionally connect to the story a lot more. After Wade becomes less insufferable, or becomes sufferable? What's, how's that term work? The date is very cute, in addition to showcasing more really beautiful and well choreographed animation. And the music goes a long way too, this is a really strong score. I think Ember's arc mostly works once they really lean into it, and is obviously very inspired by real world immigrant stories. Her parents immigrated to this new place to give her a better life, and because of their hard work and sacrifice, Ember feels like she's obligated to meet their expectations. Whether that's the expectation to run her father's business when he retires, or the expectations of what kind of people she can date. I enjoyed seeing Ember's creative passions flourish over the course of the film. It's this thing she's always been good at and is subconsciously gravitated towards without ever wondering why. And I think where their relationship works best is Wade's encouragement of Ember's dreams. The sequence where he brings her to the Vivisteria, in particular, is really beautiful. However, what is going on with this world building? This feels sweatier than even the Cars universe. Water people just sort of live in water? Like they live in skyscrapers that have pools of water everywhere and they just walk around in it? All these people are made out of these elements, but also those elements exist separate of the people as well. Would this be like humans walking around in living rooms full of blood and hair? Yuck. I loved it visually, but just felt like the world raised way more questions than answers. That being said, I love that Peter Sohn was able to inject his lived experience as a child of immigrants into a film like this. I do think that that's the stuff that clearly shines through and works best about the film, and I'm certain there are people who relate to and appreciate that story a lot. I've got issues with Elemental, but there's plenty I enjoyed as well, and it's a really pretty film. We'll leave it at that.